Chapter One: Weapons of Influence. Civilization advances by extending the number of operations we can perform without thinking about them. Alfred North Whitehead. I got a phone call one day from a friend who had recently opened an Indian jewelry store in Arizona. She was giddy with a curious piece of news. Something fascinating had just happened, and she thought that, as a psychologist, I might be able to explain it to her. The story involved a certain allotment of turquoise jewelry she had been having trouble selling. It was the peak of the tourist season. The store was unusually full of customers. The turquoise pieces were of good quality for the pieces she was for the prices she was asking yet they had not sold my friend had attempted a couple of standard sales tricks to get them moving she tried calling attention to them by shifting their location to a more central display area no luck she even told her sales staff to push the items hard again without success Finally, the night before leaving on an out-of-town buying trip, she scribbled an exasperated note to her head saleswoman. Everything in this display case, price X, V I, hoping just to be to be to get rid of the offending pieces, even if at a, at loss. When she returned a few days later, she was not surprised to find that every article had been sold. She was shocked, though, to discover that because the employee had read the W in her scrawled message as a 2, the entire allotment had sold at twice the original price. That's when she called me. I thought I knew what had happened, but told her that if I were to explain things properly, she would have to listen to a story of mine. Actually, it isn't my story. It's about mother turkeys, and it belongs to the relatively new science of ethology, the study of animals in their natural settings. Turkey mothers are good mothers, loving, watchful, and protective. They spend much of their time tending, warming, cleaning, and huddling their young beneath them. But there is something odd about their methods. Virtually all of this mothering is triggered by one thing, the cheap, cheap sound of young turkey chicks. Other identifying features of the chicks, such as their smell, touch of appearance, seem to play minor roles in the mothering process. If a chick makes the chip-chip noise, its mother will care for it. If not, the mother will ignore or sometimes kill it. The extreme reliance of maternal turkeys upon this one sound was dramatically illustrated by animal behaviorist M. W. Fox, 1974, in his description of an experiment involving a mother turkey and a stuffed polecat. For a mother turkey, a polecat is a natural enemy whose approach is to be greeted with squawking, pe pecking, clawing rage. Indeed, the experiments found that even a stuffed model of a polecat when drawn by a string to a mother turkey received an immediate and furious attack. When, however, the same stuffed replica carried inside it a small recorder that played the chip-chip sound of baby turkeys, the mother not only accepted the oncoming polecat, but gathered it underneath her. 
When the machine was turned off, the polecat model again drew a vicious attack. Click were. How ridiculous a mother turkey seems under these circumstances. She will embrace a natural enemy just because it goes chip chip and she will mistreat or murder one of her chicks just because it does not. She acts like an automaton whose maternal instincts are under the automatic control of that single sound. The Ethel August tell us that this sort of thing is far from unique to Turkey. They have begun to identify regular blindly mechanical patterns of action in a wide variety of species called fixed, fixed action patterns. They can involve intricate sequences of behavior such as entire courtship or mating rituals. A fundamental characteristic of these patterns is that the behaviors comprising them occur in virtually the same fashion and in the same order every time. It's almost as if the patterns were recorded on tapes with, within the animals. When a situation calls for courtship, a courtship tape gets played. When a situation calls for mothering, a maternal behavior tape gets played. Click and the appropriate tape is activated where and out rolls the standard sequence of behaviors. The most interesting aspect of all this is the way the tapes are activated. When an animal acts to defend its territory, for instance, it's the instruction in intrusion of another animal of the same species that cues the territorial defense tape of rigid vigilance threat and if need be combat behaviors however there is a quirk in the system it's not the rival as a whole that is triggered trigger it's rather some specific feature the trigger feature Often the trigger feature will be just one tiny aspect of the totality that is the approaching intruder. Sometimes a shade of color is a trigger feature. The experiments of ethologists have shown, for instance, that a male robin acting as if, if a rival robin had entered its territory will vigorously attack nothing more than a clump of robin red breasts feathers placed there. At the same time, it will virtually ignore a perfect stuffed replica of a male robin without red breast feathers. Lack 1943. Similar results have been found in another species of bird, the blue, the blue throat, where it appears that the trigger for territorial defense is a specific shade of blue breast feathers. Before we enjoy too smugly the ease with which trigger features can trick lower animals into reacting in ways wholly inappropriate to the situation, we should realize two things. First, the automatic fixed action pattern of these animals work very well most of the time. For example, because only normal, healthy turkey chicks make this peculiar sound of baby turkeys, it makes sense for mother turkeys to respond maternally to that single chip chip noise. By reacting to just that one stimulus, the average mother turkey will nearly always behave correctly. It takes a trickster like a scientist to make her tape like response seem silly. The second important thing to understand is that we too have our pre-programmed tapes and although they usually work to our advantage the trigger features that activate them can dupe us into playing the tapes at the wrong times. This parallel form of human automaticity is aptly demonstrated in an ex experiment by social psychologist Ellen Langer in her co-workers. A well-known principle of 
Human behavior says that when we ask someone to do us a favor, we will be more successful if we provide the reason. People simply like to have reasons for what they do. Langer demonstrated this unsurprising fact by asking a small favor of people waiting in line to use a library copying machine. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? The effectiveness of this request plus reason was nearly total. 94% of those asked let her skip ahead of them in line. Compare the success rate to the result when she made the request only. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine? Under those circumstances, only 60% of those has complied. At first glance, it appears that the crucial difference between the two requests was the additional information provided by the words because I'm in a rush. However, a third type of request tried by Langer showed that this was not the case. It seems that it was not the whole series of words but the first one because that made the difference. Instead of including a real reason for compliance, Langer third type of request used the word because and then adding nothing new merely restated the obvious. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I have to make some copies? The result was that once again nearly all, 93% agreed. Even though no real reason, no new information was added to justify their compliance. Just as the chip chip sound of turkey chicks triggered an automatic mothering response from mother turkeys, even when it emanated from a stuffed polecat, so the word because triggered an automatic compliance response from Langer subjects, even when they were given no subsequent reason to comply. Click were. Although some of Langer's additional findings show that there are many situations in which human behavior doesn't work in a mechanical, tape-activated way, she is convinced that most of the time it does. For instance, consider the strange behavior of those jewelry store customers who swoop down on an allotment of turquoise pieces only after the items had been mistaken mistakenly offered at double their original price. I can make no sense of their behavior unless it's viewed in click word terms. Although several important similarities exist between this kind of automaticity in humans and lower animals, there are some important differences as well. The automatic behavior patterns of human tend to be learned rather than inborn, more flexible than the lockstep pattern patterns of the lower animals and responsive to a larger number of triggers. Perhaps the common because, just because, response of children asked to explain their behavior can be traced to their shrewd recognition of the unusual amount of power adults appear to assign to the word because. The customer mostly well-to-do vacationers with little knowledge of turquoise were using a standard principles, a stereotype to guide their buying, expensive equals good. Much re research shows that people who are unsure of an item's quality will often use this stereotype for a review, see also 1977. Thus, the vacationers who wanted good jewelry saw the Turkish pieces as decidedly more valuable and desirable when nothing about them was enhanced but the price. Price alone had some had become a trigger feature for quality and a dramatic increase in price 
alone had led to a dramatic increase in sales among the quality hungry buyers. Readers report 1.1 from a management doctoral student. A man who owns an antique jewelry store in my town tells a story of how he learned the expensive equals good lesson of social influence. A friend of his wanted a special birthday present for his fiancé, so the jeweler picked out a necklace that would have sold in his store for 500 bucks, but that he was willing to let his friend have for 250. As soon as he saw it, the friend was enthusiastic about the piece, but when the jeweler quoted the $250 price, the man's face fell and he began backing away from the deal because he wanted something really nice for his intended bride. When a day later it dawned on the jeweler that that had happened, he called his friend and asked him to come back to the store because he had another necklace to show him. This time he introduced the new piece at its regular $500 price. His friend liked it enough to buy it on the spot. But before any money was exchanged, the jeweler told him that as a wedding gift, he would drop the price to $250. The man was thrilled. Now, rather than finding the $250 sales price offensive, he was overjoyed and grateful to have it. Author's Note Notice that as in the case of the turquoise jewelry buyers, it was someone who wanted to be assured of good merchandise who disdained the low price item. I'm confident that besides the expensive equals good rule, there is a flip side, inexpensive equals bad rule that applies to our thinking as well. After all, in English, the word cheap doesn't just mean inexpensive, it has come to mean inferior too. Betting the shortcut odds. It's easy to fault the tourists for their foolish purchase decisions, but a close look offers a kinder view. These were people who had been brought up on the rule. You in the marketing lore. The classic case of this phenomenon is that of Chivas Regal Scotch Whiskey, which had been a struggling brand until its managers decided to raise its price to a level far above its competitors. Sales skyrocketed even though nothing was changed in the product itself. These were people who had been brought up on the rule, you get what you pay for, and who had seen that rule borne out over and over in their lives. Before long, they had translated the rule to mean expensive equals good. The expensive equals good stereotype had worked quite well for them in the past, since normally the price of an item increases along with its worth. A higher price typically reflects higher quality. So when they found themselves in the position of wanting good turquoise jewelry but not having much knowledge of turquoise, they understandably relied on the old standby feature of the of cost to determine the jewelry's merits. Although they probably didn't realize it by reacting solely to the price of the turquoise, they were playing a shortcut version of betting the odds. Instead of stacking all the odds in their favor by trying painstakingly to master each feature that indicates the worth of turquoise jewelry, they were counting on on just one, the one they knew to be usually associated with the quality of any item. They were betting the price alone would tell them all they needed to know. This time, because someone mistook a VZ for a 2, they bet wrong. 
in the long run over all the past and future situations of their lives betting those shortcut odds may represent the most rational approach possible in fact automatic stereotype behavior is prevalent in much human action because in many cases it's the most efficient form of behaving and in other cases it's simply necessary you and I exist in an extraordinarily complicated environment, easily the most rapidly moving and complex that has ever existed on this planet. To deal with it, we need shortcuts. We can't be expected to recognize and analyze all the aspects in each person, event and situation we encounter in even one day. We haven't the time energy or capacity for it instead we must very often use our stereotypes our rules of thumb to classify things according to a few key features and then to respond without thinking when one or another of these triggers trigger features is present sometimes the behavior that unrolls will not be appropriate for the situation because not even the best stereotypes or and trigger features work every time we will accept their imperfection imperfections since there is there is really no other choice without these features we would stand frozen cataloging appraising and calibrating as the time for actions but by and away from all indications we will be relying on these stereotypes to an even greater extent in the future as the stimuli saturating our lives continue to grow more intricate and variable we will have to depend increasingly on our shortcuts to handle them all take by way of illustration the case of the automatic mindless consumer response to a standard trigger for buying in our society the discount coupon a tire company found that mailed out coupons which because of a printing error offered no savings to recipients produced just as much customer response as did the error-free coupons that offered substantial savings Psychologists have recently uncovered a number of mental shortcuts that we employ in making our everyday judgments. Termed judgmental heuristic, these shortcuts operate in much the same fashion as the expensive equals good rule, allowing for simplified thinking that works well most of the time but leaves us open to occasional costly mistakes. Especially relevant to this book are those heuristic that tell us when to believe or do what we are told. Consider, for example, the shortcut rule that goes, even experts said so, it must be true. As we will see in chapter 6, there is an unsetting tendency in our society to accept unthinkingly the statement and directions of individuals who appear to be authorities on this topic. That is, rather than thinking about an expert's arguments and being convinced or not, we frequently ignore the arguments and allow ourselves to be convinced just by the expert status as expert. This tendency to respond mechanically to one piece of information in a situation is what we have been calling automatic or click word responding the tendency to react on the basis of a thorough analysis of all of the information can be referred to as controlled responding controlled responding Quite a lot of laboratory research has shown that people are more likely to deal with information in a controlled fashion when they have both the desire and the ability to analyze it carefully. Otherwise, they are likely to use the easier click-war approach. For instance, 
In one study, students at the University of Missouri listened to a recorded speech that supported the idea of requiring all seniors to pass comprehensive examinations before they would be allowed to graduate. The issue affected some of them personally because they were told that the exams could go into effect in the next year before they had the chance to graduate. Of course, this news made them want to analyze the arguments carefully. However, for other subjects in the study, the issue had little personal importance because they were told that the exams would not begin until long after they had graduated. Con consequently, they had no strong need to carefully consider the argument's validity. The study the study's results were quite straightforward. Those subjects with no personal stake in the topic were primarily persuaded by the speaker's expertise in the field of education. They used the if an expert says so, it must be true rule, paying little attention to the strength of the speaker's arguments. Those subjects for whom the issue mattered personally, on the other hand, ignored the speaker's expertise and were persuaded primarily by the quality of the speaker's arguments. So it appears that when it comes to the dangerous business of click war responding, we give ourselves a safety net. We resist the seductive luxury of registering and reacting to just a single trigger feature of the available information when an issue is important to us. No doubt this is often the case. Yet I am not fully comforted. Recall that earlier we learned that people are likely to respond in a controlled, thoughtful fashion only when they have both the desire and the ability to do so. I have recently become impressed by evidence suggesting that the form and peace of modern life is not allowing us to make fully thoughtful decisions, even on many personally relevant topics. That is, sometimes the issues may be complicated, the time so tight, the destruction so intrusive, the emotional arousal so strong, or the mental fatigue so deep that we are in no cognitive condition to operate mindfully. Important topic or not, we have to take the shortcut. Perhaps nowhere in this is this last point driven home more dramatically than in the life and death consequences of a phenomenon that airline industry officials have labeled captainitis accident investigators from the federal aviation it's intrusive that even though we often don't take a complex approach to personally important topics we wish our advisors our physicians accountants lawyers and brokers to do precisely that for us when feeling overwhelmed by a complicated and consequential choice we will we still want a fully considered point-by-point -point analysis of it, an analysis we may not be able to achieve except, ironically enough, through a shortcut reliance on an expert. Administration have noted that frequently an obvious error made by a flight captain was not corrected by the other crew members and resulted in a crash. It seems that despite the clear and strong personal importance of the issues, the crew members were using the shortcut. If an expert says so, it must be true. Rule in failing to attend or respond to the captain's disastrous mistake. An account by John Watson Jr the former chairman of IBM, offers graphic evidence of the phenomenon. During World War II, he was assigned to investigate plane crashes in which high-ranking officers were killed or injured. One case involved a famous Air Force general named Uzal Ant, whose copilot got sick before co-pilot got sick 
before a flight and was assigned a replacement who felt honored to be flying alongside the legendary general during takeoffs and began singing to himself, nodding in time to a song in his head. The new co-pilot interpreted the gesture as a signal to him to lift the wheels, even though they were going much too slowly to fly. He raised the landing gear, causing the plane to drop immediately on its belly. In the wreck, a propeller blade sliced into Ant's back, severing his spine and rendering him a paraplegic. Watson described the co-pilot's explanation for his action. When I took the co-pilot's testimony, I asked him, If you knew the plane wasn't going to fly, why did you put the gear up? He said, I thought the general wanted me to. He was stupid. Stupid? In that singular set of circumstances, yes. Understandable? In the shortcut demanding maze of modern life, also yes. The profiteers. It's odd that despite their current widespread use and looming future importance, most of us know very little about our atomic automatic behavior patterns. Perhaps that is so precisely because of the mechanistic unthinking manner in which they occur. Whatever the reason it is vital that we clearly recognize one of the properties they make us terribly vulnerable to anyone who does know how they work to understand fully the future of our vulnerability let us take another glance at the work of the ethologists it turns out that these animal behaviorists with their recorded chip chips and their clumps of colored breast feathers are not the only ones who have discovered how to activate the behavior tapes of various species. One group of organisms, often termed mimics, copy the trigger features of the of other animals in an attempt to trick these animals into mistakenly playing the right behavior tapes at the wrong times. The mimics then exploit this altogether inappropriate action for their own benefit. Take for example the deadly trick played by the killer females of one genus of firefly on the males of another firefly genus. Understandably, the fortinous males scrupul- scrupulously avoid contact with the bloodthirsty photoris females. However, through centuries of natural selection, the fortuitous female hunters have located a weakness in their prey, a special blinking courtship code by which members of the victim's species tell one another they are ready to mate. By mimicking the flashing mating signals of the of her prey, the murderers is able to feast on the bodies of males whose triggered courtship tapes cause them to fly mechanically into death's not love's embrace. In the struggle for survival, nearly every form of life has its mimics, right down to some of the most primitive pathogens. By adopting certain critical features of useful hormones or nutrients, these clever bacteria and viruses can gain entry into a healthy host cell. These, the result is that the healthy cell eagerly and naively sweeps into itself the causes of such diseases as rabies, mononucleosis, and the common cold 
It should come as no surprise then that there is a strong but sad parallel in the human jungle. We too have profiteers who mimic trigger features for our own brand of automatic responding. Unlike the mostly instinctive response sequences of non-humans, however, our automatic tapes usually develop from phys- psychological principles or stereotypes we have learned to accept. Although they vary in their force, some of these principles possess a tremendous ability to direct human action. We have been subjected to them from such an early point in our lives and they have moved as about so pervasively since then that you and I rarely perceive their power. In the eyes of others, though, each such principle is a detectable and ready weapon, a weapon of automatic influence. There are some people who know very well where the weapons of automatic influence lie and who employ them regularly and expertly to get what they want. They go from social encounter to social encounter, requesting other others to comply with their wishes. Their frequency of success is dazzling. The secret of their effectiveness lies in the way that they structure their requests, the way that they arm themselves with one or another of the weapons of influence that exist is the social environment. To do this may take no more than one correctly chosen word that engages a strong psychological principle and sets rolling one of our automatic behavior tapes trust. Apparently the tendency of males Trust the human profiteers to learn quickly exactly how to benefit from our tendency to respond mechanically according to these principles. Apparently the tendency of males to be bamboozled by powerful mating signals extends to humans. Two University of Vienna biologists, Astrid Jewett and Carl Grammer, secretly exposed young men to airborne chemicals called capulins that mimic human vaginal sense. The men then rated the attractiveness of women's faces. Exposure to the capulins increased the judged attractiveness of all the women and masked the genuine physical attractiveness differences among them. As exploitative as these creatures seem, they are topped in this respect by an instinct known as the rove beetle. By using a variety of triggers involving smell and touch, the rove beetles get two species of ants to protect groom and feed them as larvae and to harbor them for the winter as adults. Responding mechanically to the beetle's tri- trigger features, the ants treat the beetles as though they were fellow ants. Inside the ant nests, the beetles respond to their host's hospitality by eating ant eggs and young, yet they're never harmed. Remember my friend, the jewelry store owner, although she benefited by accident that first time, it did not take her long to begin exploiting the expensive equals good stereotype regularly and intentionally. Now, during the tourist season, she first tries to spend the sale of an item that has been difficult to move by increasing its price substantially. The claims that this is marvelously cost-effective when it works on the unsuspecting vacationers as it frequently does, it results in an enormous profit margin. And even when it's not initially successful, she can then mark the article reduced and sell it to bargain hunters and it's at its original price while still taking advantage of their expensive equal good reaction to the inflated figure. 
by no means is my friend original in this last use of the expansive equals good rule to snare those seeking a bargain culturist and author leo rosten gives the example of the drawback brothers Sid and Harry, who owned a men's tailor shop in Roston's neighborhood in the 1930s. Whenever Sid had a new customer trying on suits in front of the shop's three-sided mirror, he would admit to a hearing problem and repeatedly request that the man speak more loudly to him. Once the customer had found a suit he liked and asked for the price, Sid would call to his brother, the head tailor, at the back of the room. Harry, how much for the suit? Looking up for, from his work and greatly exaggerating the suit's true price, Harry would call back for that beautiful all-wool suit, $42, pretending not to have heard and cup and cupping his hand to his ear, Seed would ask again. Once more, Harry would reply, $42. At this point, Seed would turn to the customer and report, he says, $22. Many a man would hurry to buy the suit and scramble out of the shop with his expensive equals good bargain before poor Seed discovered the mistake. Jiu-Jitsu A woman employing the Japanese martial art from form called Jiu-Jitsu would use her own strengths only minimally against an opponent. Instead, she would exploit the power inherent in such naturally present principles as gravity, leverage, momentum, and intertia. If she knows how and where to engage the action of these principles, she can easily defeat a physical stronger rival. And so it is for the exploiters of the weapon of automatic influence that exists naturally around us. The profiteers can commission the power of these weapons for use against their targets while exer exerting little personal force this last feature of the process gives the profiteers an enormous additional benefit the ability to manipulate without the appearance of manipulation even the victims themselves tend to see their compliance as a result of the action of natural forces rather than the designs of the person who profits from that compliance an example is in order there is a principle in human perception, the contrast principle, that affects the way we see difference between two things that are presented one after another. Simply put, if the second item is fairly different from the first, we will tend to see it as more different than it actually is. So, if we lift a light object first and then lift a heavy object, we will estimate the second object to be heavier than if we had lifted it without first lifting the light one. The contrast principle is well established in the field of psycholo psychophysics and applies to all sorts of perceptions besides weight. If we are talking to a very attractive individual at a party and are then joined by an unattractive individual, the second will strike us as less attractive than he or she actually is. Another demonstration of percept perceptual contrast is sometimes employed in psychophysics laboratories to introduce students to the principle. Each student takes a turn sitting in front of three pails of water, one cold, one at room temperature, and one hot. After placing one hand in the cold water and one in the hot water, the student is told to place both hands in the room temperature water simultaneously. 
the look of amused bewilderment that immediately registers tells the story. Even though both hands are in the same bucket, the hand that has been in the cold water feels as if it's now in hot water, while the one that was in the hot water feels as if it is now in cold water. The point is that the same thing in this instance room temperature water can be made to seem very different depending on the nature of the event that precedes it. Be assured that the nice little weapon of influence provided by the contrast principle does not an exploit it. The great advantage of this principle is not only that it works but also that it is virtually undetectable. Those who employ it can cash in on its influence without any appearance of having structured the situation in their favor. Retail clothiers are a good example. Suppose a man enters a fashionable men's store and says that he wants to buy a three-piece suit and a sweater. If you were the salesperson, which would you show him first to make him likely to spend the most money? Clothing stores instruct their sales personnel to sell the costly item first. Common sense might suggest the reverse. If a man has just spent a lot of money to purchase a suit, he may be reluctant to spend much more on the purchase of a sweater. But the clothiers know better. They behave in accordance with what the contrast principle would suggest. Sell the suit first, because when it comes time to look at sweaters, even expensive ones, their prices will not seem as high in comparison. The same principle applies to a man who wishes to buy the accessories, shirt, shoes, belt, to go along with his new suit. Contrary to the common sense view, the evidence supports the contrast principle prediction according to sales motivation analysis. Some researchers warn that the unrealistically attractive people portrayed in the popular media across actors, actresses, models may cause us to be less satisfied with the looks of the genuinely available romantic possibilities around us. For instance, one study demonstrated that exposure to the exaggerated sexual attractiveness of nude pin-up bodies in such magazines as Playboy and Playgirl causes people to become less pleased with the sexual desirability of their current spouse or living mate. Clever use of perceptual contrast is by no means confined to clothiers. I came across a technique that engaged the contrast principle while I was investigating undercover the compliance tactics of real estate companies. To learn the ropes, I was accompanying a company realty salesman on a weekend of showing houses to prospective home buyers. The salesman, we can call him Phil, was to give me tips to help me through my break-in period. One thing I quickly noticed was that whenever Phil began showing a new set of customers potential buys, he would start with a couple of undesirable houses. I asked him about it and he laughed. They were what we called setup properties. The company maintained a rundown house or two on its list at inflated prices. These houses were not intended to be sold to customers but to be shown to them so that the genuine properties in the company's inventory would benefit from the comparison. Not all the sales staff made use of the setup houses, but Phil did. He said he liked to watch his prospect's eyes light up when he showed the place he really wanted to sell them after they had seen the rundown houses. The house I got them spotted for looks really great after they first looked at a couple of dumps. 
automobile dealers use the, the contrast principle by waiting until the price for a new car has been negotiated before suggesting one option after another that might be added. In the wake of a $15,000 deal, the 100 or so dollars required for a nicety like an FM radio seems almost trivial in comparison. The same will be true of the added expense of accessories like tinted windows, dual side view mirrors, white wall tires or special trim that the salesman might suggest in sequence. The trick is to bring up the extras independently for of one another so that each small price will seem petty when compared to the already determined much larger one. As the as the veteran car buyer can attest, many a budget sized final price figure has ballooned from the additional of all those seemingly little options. While the customer stands signed contract in hand, wondering what happened and finding no one to blame but himself, the car dealer stands smiling the knowing smile of the jiu-jitsu master. Reader's Report from the Parent of a College Code Dear Mother and Dad, since I left for college, I have been remiss in writing and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness in not having written before. I will bring you up to date now, but before you read on, please sit down. You are not re to read any further unless you are sitting down, okay? Well then, I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion I got when I jumped out the window of my dormitory when it caught on fire shortly after my arrival here is pretty well healed now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital and now I can see almost normally and only get those sick headaches once a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dormitory and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm and he was the one who called the fire department and the ambulance he also visited me in the hospital and since i had nowhere to live because of the burnout dormitory he was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him it's really a basement room but it's kind of cute he is a very fine boy and we have fallen deeply in love and are planning to get married we haven't got the exact date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. Yes, mother and dad, I'm pregnant. I know how much you are looking forward to being grandparents, and I know you will welcome the baby and give it the same love and devotion and tender care you gave me when I was a child. The reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has a minor infection which prevents us from passing our premarital blood tests, and I carelessly caught it from, from him. Now that I have brought you up to date, I want to tell you that there was no dormitory fire. I didn't have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I am not pregnant. I am not engaged. I am not infected. And there is no boyfriend. However, I am getting a D in American history and an F in chemistry. And I want to see those marks in their proper perspective. Your loving daughter, Sharon. Sharon may be failing chemistry, but she gets an A in psychology.